Hi everyone, my name is Steph, this is the Novelty Corner and welcome welcome back to my channel. Today I have a Books Beside My Bed video for you where I wrap up the last seven days worth of reading. This is my reading week from the 2nd until the 8th of September and I managed to read 11 things this week, ticking off quite a few of my September Reset TBR books. Not everything, because that would be silly, but I did manage to get through a few of them, which means at the end of this video, there are going to be five more rolls from my TBR game. So stay tuned for that or use the timestamp down below to jump to it if you would like to. I'm going to talk about two kids books at the start. The first one, which was just a book that I read actually for a project for my other channel and a few other work related things was Fairy Bread by Ursula Dubasarsky. This is part of the Puffin Nibbles series. Now when this series first came out they actually did these little nibble cutouts in the book so it actually looked like someone had chomped on the book and they're really fun but they have re-released them and I was reading this because I've been on the hunt for early chapter books that would make good book club books for years one to sort of four depending on reading level and reading age. I read this one. This one is really fun. This is about Becky. It's her birthday. She wants to have fairy bread for her birthday. It's the only thing she wants to have at her birthday party. If you're not from Australia, fairy bread is basically white bread with butter and sprinkles or hundreds and thousands on it. And it is, you know, a quintessential Australian party food. So anyway, Becky makes heaps and heaps of fairy bread and of course it doesn't all get eaten at the party and then she has to figure out what to do with it because she doesn't want to throw it away and waste it. So this is a cute little story about being creative but also being unwilling to let something go and a mother who is pretty tired of having fairy bread around the house. So this was a really fun cute little story. And I also read Miss Mary Kate's Guide to Monsters book 2, The Trouble with the Two-Headed Hydra by Karen Foxley. This is kind of a fantasy-ish, paranormal-ish story set in our world. Mary Kate is a young girl who has some anxiety but she travels around with her mother who is I think an archaeologist and she solves mysteries. She and her mother end up in Greece and then she finds out that the local townspeople are being attacked by the mythical two-headed hydra who lives in the bay and some people believe that the hydra is real some people don't believe it there is also a i think it's a sardine plant in town and mary kate may or may not uncover some unsustainable fishing methods some environmentally unsound practices and also maybe the two-headed hydra so it's really fun it's very fast paced and well written there are illustrations throughout the book it's a fun series I read the first one last year and I did get sent this one for review I read this for my TBR game to read a review copy so I finally read it and I need to actually write up my review and post it but it is a really fun series and really enjoyable the next book I won't talk about a lot because I have a full annotation video which I'll leave linked on the screen and that was a reread of With You Forever by Chloe Lease this was my third reread it is a contemporary romance between an autistic hero and a heroine who is dealing with a chronic illness they have a marriage of convenience they are sharing a very small cabin and falling for one another and it is just precious and my favorite book in the Bergman Brothers series by Chloe Lee. I also read The Labor Day Chronicle by Lee Jacko which is the most recent release in the Holy Night series. Did I bother to look up what Labor Day meant over in the US? No I did not. It's not necessary for this book except to know that there is a public holiday of some sort in the story. This is a workplace romance between a veteran investigative journalist and his assistant Eva who became a journalist because of him and loves working for him but just finds him to be an absolute grump and just gruff and very dismissive at times of her. But over the Labor Day weekend they are working on solving a crime that's been happening in the neighborhood for the next edition of the newspaper and it brings them closer together and they actually have to spend time in one in each other's presence. It's short, it's steamy and it's really fun. The Holy Night series is just consistently great each time we get a new book in it. I also read Heated Rivalry by Rachel Reed. This is the second book in the Game Changers series. It is the most popular one and it is one of the first books that people recommend when you start talking about hockey romance books and I understand why but what I don't think people do really well is actually talk about what the book is actually about because I was really nervous going into this that I was going to be the person that went hey yeah no I hate this because it's so popular but if someone had actually just explained the basic premise of it to me I would have jumped in and read it months ago because it is exactly what I enjoy reading. It is an MM rivals to lovers hockey romance and our two characters Shane and Ilya are rivals. They have been rivals since they were rookies. They were both slated to be the number one draft pick the year that they were drafted and so the media and everyone has built up this rivalry around them. So they've got this external pressure coming down on them because they're the two best players of their age and both are coming at hockey from very different backgrounds and very different support levels. They're 
constantly meeting each other when they're playing games. And I think they're 19 when they're drafted and that's sort of the first moment where they have this encounter where they realize that, you know, there is an attraction between the two of them. But of course they're drafted to rival teams. And so their relationship develops through clandestine meetings over the years as they are playing one another. And that means they only see each other, you know, a handful of times throughout the year. And every time they meet, they end up hooking up. By the time we get to sort of the present day in the story, you know, they're, they're questioning whether this is something that's going to continue, whether it's something that's more, whether it's something that's sustainable, whether it's something that they can even do. And of course, everyone in the hockey world believes that they are rivals and that they hate each other. And on the ice, they play like they hate each other and then they're sleeping together. It's complex and interesting and the way that they have to evolve their relationship and the way that they have to convince people around them that they're actually in love and that they don't hate each other is really interesting. I did love that there is no third act breakup in this book, but it is also an HFN. There is a second book that follows this couple. I'm probably gonna read the series through consecutively so I will eventually get to that book. I don't know how I feel about needing a second book. I know everyone has said that the second book is great, but we'll see when I get there. Content warning in here for, for death of a parent, and it is mentioned that it is an overdose. So it is historical of page, but it is in there. So just be kind to yourself if you're reading it. But yes, I was glad that the hype proved to be correct on this one because it was really enjoyable. I also read Divine River by Marina Vivancos. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. This is a contemporary MM small town novella. We have a single POV, our point of view hero is gay. He is very private and he is a woodworker. And then one day someone moves into the place next door to him and is just insistent about being friends and making friends with his new neighbor. And that is initially confronting, but Mike eventually begins to, you know, come to like having this contact with his neighbor where previously he's just been very, very private. And it is an exploration of the development of their relationship. It's also an exploration of gender expression through clothing and living in a small town where your family still lives, where your family are homophobic. And there is some of that on page, but I will say there is a really fantastic friend group in this novella. It felt a lot longer than it actually was. I think it's only like 130 pages, but it felt like there was a lot more in the story. It probably could have used a couple of extra chapters just to flesh it out and round it out a little bit more, but it was a great story and well worth picking up. I also read The Head Wolf by Andy J. Christopher. This was another book for my reset TBR. And this is a novella that I received when I was a Patreon for the HEA Collective. And this is a second chance paranormal romance story between an empath and an alpha wolf. And the empath is trying to track down her sister who has gone missing and the wolf ends up taking her to a werewolf sex club, which is her sister's last known location. This story has werewolves and vampires. Kind of feels like it should be sitting in the middle of a series with a little bit more world building. There was enough in here to understand the story, but you kind of left wanting a little bit more knowledge about what's going on. So I haven't gone into Andy J. Christopher's backlist to see if there's anything that surrounds it, but it was an interesting concept. It was pretty steamy. It is very short and it was an intriguing premise. Like I, I would like to read more. Another September reset TBR pick was Wolf Willow Witch, which is the most recent book in the Gideon Chronicles by Freitas Moon. In hindsight, I probably should have read Heart Haunt Havoc or reread Heart Haunt Havoc before I picked this up because I, at some points I'm like, hang on, I know this character, I know these characters are in the other book, but I have totally forgotten the context of it, but I eventually picked it up, so that's fine. So our heroine is Taylor. She stumbles across a corpse in her best friend's house and decides to reanimate it. She is a Norse necromancer and she ends up bringing Lincoln Stone back to life. Part of bringing him back to life means that he has a wolf head and he has to glamour to hide that because he's wolf head, human body. And to say that the two do not get along at the start is probably an understatement, but eventually they band together because there appears to be a religious cult in town doing some very questionable things and they begin to investigate it because they believe that there is a holy relic that this cult may have got its hands on and they want to track it down but they uncover much more going on. Despite its short length, it does come with quite a few content warnings. I'm gonna have to read them because there's so many. So we have body horror, animal mutilation, mania, murder, SA, religious abuse, obsessive behavior, drowning and panic, and probably other things in there that I just didn't pick up on, but it was great. It's a horror monster-ish romance and I had a great time reading it. I'm loving Freitas Moon's writing. I think it's very easy to read. They are doing some really cool things in this space, particularly in such short page counts. I also read Out of Pucks by Bailey Keane. This is a contemporary hockey romance. 
and it starts as a one night stand between an architect and a hockey player, although she doesn't realise he's a hockey player at the time, until she gets back to her hometown and she realises he is the star hockey player in her hometown and the project that she is currently working on is building the new stadium for his team and so they constantly run into one another. This was fairly short, it was entertaining. The one thing I will say though, there were quite a few typos and formatting errors in the book, which I'm, I don't necessarily always mark the book down for that, but it probably could have used an extra editing pass just to check that those things had been fixed. There is also toxic parenting in this one. And if you are not someone who likes constantly being reminded that the hero is ginormous and the heroine is tiny, this does have size difference and just be aware of that going into it. I also read Bayou Moon by Alona Andrews, which is the second book in the Edge series, which is for the read along, which is coming up on the 20th of September. I finally read this one early, just I needed something that I knew I was going to really enjoy reading. I was talking to Heather after I read it and we both agreed that this one felt a lot darker than some of Alona Andrews' other works. I didn't notice it so much as I was reading it but when I was reflecting on it going yeah actually it is kind of dark and I think this is mostly because some of the characters that we meet in this story are these monstrous characters who have had quite a lot of body manipulation or body and it has body horror elements to it so be aware of that going into it. I, I don't think it's super graphic and, and super bad, but if you are sensitive at all to that, just be aware of it. So this is William's book. We'll, we met William in book one. He is a wolf changeling and wolf changelings are not very well thought of in the weird, which is the magical world. And he has kind of exiled himself to living on the edge and he works in the broken, which is the human world. But he is approached by spies from the weird to track down an enemy of his country in the weird who kills changeling children and this is someone William has been trying to track down for years and years. He's faced him twice, they've walked away from each other twice, both severely injured and this is his chance to actually end this guy. And so William reluctantly agrees to get involved in the weird's politics again in order to take out Spider. And along the way he meets Cerise who is part of a family who was exiled from the weird to the edge. They're basically thought of as felons and they live in the bayou and she and her family are in a turf war with another family living in the edge. And when her parents are taken by Spider with the assistance of this other family, all hell breaks loose. There's a lot more that goes on and sort of the, like the internal reason, like the little smaller reasons for what's going on. There's some betrayal and some really interesting characters. What I loved about this book, Cerise is really kick-ass. She is a, I think she's 23, but she has to take on the role of head of family. And that has various implications for her and for everyone else around her. Will is just great. He is just trying to figure himself out. He kind of just wants a quiet life, but he wants a family and he wants to fall in love. But he's been brought up to believe that no one will love changelings. And he's, like, he's just, he's a mess, but we love him. If you followed us from the Innkeeper Chronicles series, Gaston and Sophie are introduced in this book. And I have such a deeper appreciation of Sophie's character now from reading this book because there's a lot that goes on. And I just want to spend more time with the kids because the kids are great. We also do spend some time with the characters from the previous book in small doses and it's wonderful. And I just, I love Will's relationship with Jack, who is also a changeling and Will's just commentary on how, you know, non-changelings just really struggle to raise changeling children because they keep trying to suppress all of the changeling instincts. But anyway, I will be talking about this book in more depth with the rest of the group on the 20th, so feel free to join us then. And then the last book that I read this week was Hollow by C.M. Nascosta, which is a recent release and was on my new release radar from my reset. This is actually a collection of two short stories featuring the Headless Horseman myth. The first one is an MMM, Ichabod Crane and the Headless Horse Men, plural story and it is a voyeuristic story and there is some degradation humiliation kink in there very mild but it's in there and then the second story is more of a historical retelling of the myth and it is Katrina von Tassel being the center and her relationship with the Headless Horseman. They were short and easy to read and this would probably be a fun one to read in October if you are thinking about picking up myth retellings. Which brings me to the end of my TBR and into the next five rolls for my TBR game for the month. So roll number one. So for roll number one, I landed on chance and I ended up with a Nalini scene prompt. For this, I'm going to go with Lord of the Abyss. I think this was a Harlequin Nocturne title. Anyway, I haven't read it. I've had it on my Kindle for ages. We're coming into spooky season. And so let's just roll with more paranormal reads because 
unlike the rest of the world, which is going into autumn, we're going into spring and apparently in my brain that just goes, huh, it's getting warmer. Let's just read Paranormal Romance, which is like the total opposite of everyone else. But anyway, we're going with it. Do I know anything about the book? No, not a clue. Roll number two. For roll number two, I ended up on Andrew's Drive, which was one of Heather's prompts. And for this one, I rolled Monster. And for this, I'm going to read Deal with the Demon by Amy Wright, which is a KU title that I have. I've had fairly good success with books with this title, so we'll try it. Roll number three. Roll three was a chance card and it was a mood read, so I'm not actually going to set a book for this. I'm just going to pick up whatever I feel like and use it for this prompt. A little bit of freedom. That's what we like. Roll four. So for roll four, I landed on Fan Fiction Way, which was one of May's prompts. And the specific prompt for, from this card was to read a novella that you have been putting off. And for this, I'm going to read The Outback Governess by Sarah Williams, which is an Australian romance. Pretty sure this one is a closed door one, but it is only novella length and I've had it for ages. I just need to read it. Roll number five. And of course, for roll number five, I landed on roll again. So I roll in two more times because I need to get two more books. So roll number six. For this roll, I landed on Nevada Drive, which was one of Megan's picks. And the prompt was to read a book where the main character has a pet. For this, I'm going with a middle grade title. This is Ming and Flo Fight for the Future by Jackie French. There is a pet on the cover. Well, it's an animal on the cover. I'm going to assume it is a pet. So we're going with this. Last roll, roll number seven. So for this, I landed on Snow Dancer Place. So this was Julie's prompt and the specific prompt was green cover. So I think I'm finally going to pick up Terms and Conditions by Lauren Asher because I have not continued the series and uh, I need to. So that is it for my wrap up and my next round of TBR game prompts. In the comments, I'd love to know if you've read any of these books or if you're planning on picking any of them up or feel free to share something that you have been reading and loving over the last week. If you just want to let me know that you're here but you don't want to leave a comment, feel free to leave a moon emoji down below. Otherwise, I hope that wherever you are in the world, you are staying safe and healthy, and I will see you in my next video. Thanks so much for watching. Bye, everyone.